Now we're going to look at the factors affecting uh, the power. So the first one is the size of the effect. So what is, let's say, the mean of the two different distributions? The larger the effect size, the larger your power will be. And the second factor is the standard deviation of the characteristics. In other words, how noisy your data is. The noisier your data becomes, the lower your power will be. And the third factor is your sample size. So a larger sample size is good, is a good thing. So other things being equal, a bigger sample size will increase your statistical power. And the last one is the significance level desired. If you uh, have a lower significance level, meaning you know lower error rate, type 1, type 2 error rate, then uh, the lower your power will be. So that's the factors affecting your power. So now we're going to go through a set of graphical illustrations to give us some intuition about why these factors affect the statistical power. And then we're going to derive it formally. So the first one is, you know, larger effect size increases power. What is the effect size? The effect size is in these two distributions, you have a null distribution, which is on the upper panel, and an alternative distribution on the lower panel. So a larger effect size means that the difference between the mean of the two distributions is larger. So when it's larger, the overlap is smaller, which means that you will have more statistical power. So if the alternative is moved further away from the null, then that increases your power. So that's the first factor. The second factor is about the standard deviation. So the standard deviation remember, measures the noise in the data. So the bigger the standard deviation, the lower your power will be. So standard deviation decreases power. And so here are, again, our null and alternative distributions. And uh, noisier data means that the distributions are fatter. And if they become fatter, other things being equal, there will be more overlapping regions. It makes it easier for you to make inference errors. So that's why it decreases power. The third one is sample size. So a larger sample size would increase your power. Why is that true? So again, let's start with these two distributions. When the sample size becomes larger, that means your distribution becomes more squeezed together. When they're more squeezed together, the overlapping in the tails will be smaller, which means that um, that increases your power. Again, that you know, reduces the likelihood that you make an inference error. And the last one is significance level. And we say that higher significance level decreases power. So from the same graphics, we can see that the rejection region, which is the alpha in your, the, the error rate alpha, depicts the region on your right. And if that becomes uh, higher, more significant, which means that's shifting towards the right, then there will be more overlap. Uh, the tails will overlap more with the distribution of the treatment that increases the likelihood that you make an inference error. So there is this same trade-off between type 1 and type 2 errors. So these are the factors. Now we're going to derive these in a more rigorous way. So the derivations comes from the List, Sadoff, and Wagner 2011 paper. We will go through the first two parts in their paper. One is the simplest case, 0, 1 treatment. 0 means the control, and 1 means the treatment. So you have two experimental conditions, a control condition and a treatment condition. And it's also the very simple example where the outcome variables are equally noisy in the treatment and the control condition. So that's the, our simplest case. So now we're going to uh, derive some of the principles for sample size allocation. We're going to look at the simplest case and start with the case where 
the treatment is denoted by t equals 1, so t for treatment, and the control is set to t equals 0. Then the outcome variable x0, x0, so think of the outcome variable. If we continue our education example, this is the test score, the test score of the students in the control condition. So it follows a normal distribution with mean mu naught and variance sigma naught squared. And then x1 is the test scores of the treat treatment condition. So let's say the treatment has a smaller class size. And that also follows the normal distribution with mean mu1 and variance sigma1 squared. So from now on, the zeros almost always denote the control condition, whereas the one, the subscript one, denotes the treatment condition. So the minimum detectable effect is the difference in these two means. So it's mu1 minus mu0. And we use the Greek letter delta for the difference between the control and the treatment. So delta is the Greek letter equivalence for D. So the null hypothesis is that there's no effect. So reducing the class size doesn't really change the learning outcome. So the null is going to be mu naught equals mu 1, whereas the alternative hypothesis is that there is an effect size. So the treatment condition, when you reduce the class size, you produce a difference in the average test score. So mu 1 minus mu naught equals delta, which is positive. So then we will need the difference in sample means x1 minus x0. So that's what we use to test the hypotheses to satisfy two conditions. So these are the statistical requirements. So the first one is significance level. That's the probability that you make a type 1 error. And so we use the Greek letter alpha for type 1 error. And then the second one is the power. So you, as the experimenter, will need to commit ahead of time uh, how, how large the power should be. And so we use 1 minus the probability of type 2 error. So that's going to be 1 minus beta. So these two conditions will give us two equations to help us solve the sample size. So these are the two equations. What do you have here is the first equation gives you t of alpha over 2. So that's the probability of a type 1 error. So recall the t statistics. So we're going to have x1 minus x0 divided by basically the noise in the data, which is sigma0 squared over n0 plus sigma1 squared over n1. And we take the square root of that. And then what we do now is to multiply both sides with the denominator. So that gives us x1 minus x0 equals t of alpha over 2 times this um, square root uh, symbol. So that's the first condition. The second condition is that the power is set to 1 minus beta. So we could set beta equals 0.2 or 0.1, depending on a host of factors, your, your budget, and how, how much error you're willing to tolerate. So that will give us another equation, which is x1 minus x0 minus delta. Uh, delta is the minimum detectable effect. So remember, delta stands for basically the difference between the treatment and the control condition. And that equals minus t of beta. So this, again, gives us the, the condition. So again, we multiply both sides of the equation with the denominator. So that gives us x1 minus x0 equals delta minus t times the square root of essentially the standard error. So what you have is that if you look at equation 1 and equation 2, the cleaned up one on the right hand side, you recognize that they both have x1 minus x0. So which means that we can reduce these two equations into one. So the right hand side of the equa of equation one can equal the right hand side of equation two. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So we solve equations one and two by equating the right-hand side of equations 1 and 2. 
And remember, this is the simple case where we, we assume C equal variance, which means that the treatment and the control conditions will generate data that has the same amount of noise. So sigma 1 squared equals sigma 2 squared. That will give you the optimal solution, which is when there's equal variance, you want to set the sample size in the treatment condition and the control condition to be the same, which is n star. OK, we use the, the term n star to stand for that. So that equals two times in the parentheses. You have t of alpha over 2 plus t of beta squared times the sigma delta ratio squared. OK, so let's interpret this formula. So what does this formula tell us? Well, the first thing it tells us is that if the treatment and control conditions will generate the same variance, then you want to split your sample. Basically, allocate the same number of users to your treatment and the same number of users to your control condition. The second part is that if you are desired significance level and power, which is your alpha and beta, increases, that increases the sample size. And then the next factor, let's look at uh, sigma squared. So sigma is the noise in the data. If sigma goes up, which is if the data you generate um, is going to be very noisy, you have to have a larger sample size. So the sample size is going to increase proportionally with the variance of the outcome variables. How about the minimum detectable size, the delta? So the difference, remember, delta is the difference between the treatment mean and the control mean. If the anticipated difference is going to be large, you don't have to have as many observations. So, so the sample size would decrease proportionally with the square of the minimum detectable size. So let's wrap this up. OK, so the sample size depends on several factors. It depends on the ratio of the effect size to standard deviation. So that's what we're going to say over and over again. It's the sigma delta ratio. And it's going to also depend on the significance level, the alpha and the beta that you set ahead of time. The other part to notice is what if you don't have any pilot data? When you design your experiment and you want to calculate the sample size, you don't have any data to work from, then how do you set the sample size? You simply need to set the sigma delta ratios. In other words, the effect size can be expressed in standard deviations. That will solve your problem. So let's look at several examples of that. So if you use alpha equals 5% and power 80%, and you want to detect a one standard deviation change using the standard approach, you know, all the assumptions are satisfied, are satisfied. that means that we're, we're going to need sigma equals delta, or the sigma delta ratio is going to be 1. So we plug it back into our formula. We're going to get n equals 2 times 1.96 plus 0.84. That's the t statistics for alpha equals 5% and power beta equals 20%. So that number squared times the sigma delta ratio, which is 1 squared, that means you, you're going to get 15.68. And we cannot have any fraction of subjects participating in any experiment. So that's going to be 16. In that case, you only need 16 subjects in your control condition and 16 in your treatment condition. What if you want to be able to detect a half standard deviation change. So in this case, the sigma delta ratio is going to be 2, right? So sigma over half of sigma. And that means you're going to have to multiply your standard sample size by a factor of 4, which means now you need 64 observations per cell. Um, so we can keep looking at the rule of thumb. What if we only tolerate the beta equals 0.5, so from 0.2 to 0.05, sorry, not 0.5, 0.05, then your sample size will have to be 1.65 times n. What if type 1 error is now reduced to 1%? 
and the power is 80%. Then you basically need one half times the sample size. And the last one, let's say alpha equals 1% and beta equals 5%. Now you need essentially 227% of your original sample size. Okay, so that's how we derive rules of thumb when we decide how many subjects to assign to the treatment condition versus the control condition. So now we're going to move on to something a little more complicated, uh, which is now your treatment and control condition have different variants. So the data is not going to be equally noisy as we just covered. Now it's going to be more complicated, but we use the same principle. Um, in deriving our sample size. So we'll go back to equations one and two. So I'm not going to derive every step, but you can refer to the original paper if you're interested. Now the total number of subjects that you will need, n star, is going to be again a function of the t statistics for the type 1 error alpha over 2 and t of beta. Again, if the effect, si the effect size is in the denominator, delta is there, and you see sigma 1 squared and sigma 0 squared. But there are two new notations, which is the pi naught star and pi 1 star, and they're just a shorthand notation for the ratio of the sigmas. So. The bottom line of this is that you can still solve analytically for the optimal sample size. But in most of the cases, we're just going to plug it into our statistical software and let the software do the calculation for us. And so in most cases, you should be able to you know, have either some old data, which enables you to compute the empirical effect size and variance pilot data, or you can think about the sigma delta ratio, and that will help you com compute the uh, sample size. Okay. Now we're going to look at more factors. You know, what if you have a budget constraint? So in all previous analysis, we assume that you have no budget constraint, so you can basically use as many subjects as you like. However, if the cost of collecting data from a subject in the control condition is different from the cost of collecting data from the treatment, what are you going to do? Um, so we can do some derivations just as what we did before. So we know the delta, right? That's the difference between the treatment mean and the control mean. So that's the minimum detectable effect size. So we have that derivation already, and we also know how much it costs us as the experimenter or the analyst to collect one unit of observation from a user in the control condition. So we denote the marginal cost to be C0, and the marginal cost for a subject from the treatment condition is going to be C1. And your total budget, you know, you're given a budget, let's say, of $20,000. So you cannot break the budget constraint. The s dot t dot is subject to the budget constraint that, that your entire spending on the control subject and the entire spending on the treatment subject should add up to your budget. Okay, What are you going to do in this case? Uh, we can derive this. You can do this uh, probably uh, after class. What you can do is to solve n naught as a function of n1. Uh, from the constraint and plug it into the objective function, um, then you have essentially one equation. You take the first order condition that will give you one equation and one unknown, and you should be able to derive the optimal proportion between the number of subjects in the treatment condition and the number of subjects in the control condition. That's the last line, which is n1 star over n0 star. What is that? That's going to be the square root of C0 over C1 times sigma1 over sigma0. So let's look at the right-hand side of this equation. So that says that sigma is the standard deviation of the data in the treatment or the control condition. So sigma1 says 
That's the standard deviation, how noisy the data is in the treatment. And sigma zero is the standard deviation in the control condition. So this tells us that if the treatment is going to have a large variance, it's going to be more noisy, then we want to put more subjects in the treatment condition. And so the ratio of allocation is going to be proportional to sigma one over sigma naught. So that's one con condition. What about the condition underneath you know, the square root of C naught over C one that says that if the treatment condition is very expensive, if C1 is large, then this entire ratio is going to be small. Then we're going to scale back the number of subjects we put into the treatment condition, but not proportional to the marginal cost. It's proportional to the square root of the marginal cost. So this is all very intuitive. So this exercise essentially says that this is a very flexible analytical framework. Depending on your uh, objective in the experiment and depending on your constraint, you can you know, change it and solve for the optimal sample size.